I would like to extend a very warm welcome um, to all of you attending this kickoff event, both in person and online. And we are happy to know that we are, have many uh, attending this event online from all over the world. Um, so a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Um, my name is Caroline Höglund, and I am the president of a Swedish organization named HARO, and also the European Federation, FIFAF. I have been part of this initiative since 2019 um, that we will hear about today, but today I will be your moderator. Uh, so let me give you just a quick background about this initiative. Since 2018, a group of transnational and regional organizations have been preparing for the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. We have done that by arranging 16 race awareness events, two expert group meetings, three focus groups, 18 Zoom meetings, 64 draft suggestions, and 23 expert recommendations to work on this civil society declaration. We hope that the declaration will be an instrument to raise awareness um, of challenges regarding families or related to families, that it will raise awareness of the importance of the family, and also that the family unit will be supported by positive policies, policies and social development ahead. So thanks to the continuous efforts and of the various organizations involved up until now, the Civil Society Declaration will now be launched as an enriched draft. And we are happy to share some thoughts uh, regarding this with you today. And also to invite you and your organizations to be part of it. So I will first give the floor to our hosts starting with Luciano Malfe, Director General of the Provincial Agency for Social Cohesion, Family and Birth of the Autonomous Province of Trento in Italy. Mr. Malfe, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Luciano Malfe. I'm the Director of Family Agency of uh, autonomous, autonomous province of Trento. I thank, thank the organize, organizers of the conference. First of all, my friend Ignacio for the uh, collaboration about this event and uh, the colleague in uh, Chamo that work here in Brussels. Um, uh, it is with great pleasure that the autonomous province of Trento, the autonomous province of Bolzano and the Austrian Tyrol welcome you to our representative offices in Brussels. It is a great honor for us to open this working seminar in preparation for the third anniversary of the International Year in the family, of the family. As you know, the autonomous province of Trento has been working for more than 10 years on the issues of family well-being. And at the, end, at the end of my short greeting, the greeting is already over. Uh, allow me to show you a short video on the family municipality, family-friendly municipality process activated in our country in these 10 years of the work. I wish everyone a good seminar. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Malfer. That was wonderful. Um, it is also an honor to have the presence of Mrs. Vesna Caminades, head of liaison office of the autonomous province of Bolzano, South Tyr Tyrol in Italy, who will also deliver some remarks in representation of Waltraud Dig, deputy provincial governor and provincial counselor in charge of family, senior citizens, social affairs and housing. Mrs. Caminades, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, actually, uh, I would like to thank you all that we can host this event. It's an honor for us. And just 10 seconds, sorry, and just 10 seconds to tell you that we are a cross-border representation office here in Brussels since over 25 years. So two Italian regions, it's South Tyrol and Trentino, the colleague Caterina over there, Mr. Luciano Malfer already talked to you, and the Austrian land, Tyrol. So that's very important for us that we appear as a common office. Now I have one minute and a half for the message of our provincial councillor. Family is not only important on International Family Day on 15th of May. Every day is Family Day because families are the basis of our society. They are the ones who exemplify values and continue to fill them with life. In order to be able to support them well in their everyday lives, measures and appreciation are needed. I am therefore very pleased that the International Federation for Family Development, together with many partners all over the world, is working for greater appreciation of families worldwide and has drawn up a declaration for this in view of the Jubilee year in 2024. I'm very pleased that the autonomous province of Bozen, Bolzano, South Tyrol is co-hosting with Trentino the presentation of the civil society declaration here in Brussels in our common representation. Because in the European region, Tyrol, South Tyrol, Trentino, too, we seek exchange among ourselves and network in the interest of families. Families, whether in South Tyrol, in Brussels or worldwide, are the pillars of our society. And I wish you a good, fruitful event. Thank you very much. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Um, we will now have our opening remarks from Renata Kasmarska. Before I let her share her thoughts, let me introduce her. Renata Kasmarska is a social affairs officer and the focal point on family in the Division for Inclusive Social Development in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs at the United Nations uh, Secretariat in New York. She acts as a spokesperson on family issues for the United Nations Secretariat. She prepares publications and drafts UN reports on a variety of subjects relating to families. She organizes international and regional expert group meetings on family policy issues, observances of the International Day of Families, and other events to raise awareness of the importance of family policies for the achievement of sustainable development goals and targets. She is currently engaged in the preparations for the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family in 2024. She holds a Master's of Science science degree in social sciences and bachelor of arts in political science as well as a united nations studies graduate diploma so we will now hear from renata through a link uh, all the way from new york morning new york 
Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Greetings from the United Nations headquarters in New York. Um, as our celebrations of the International Day of Families continue with many events around the world, it's an honor to be part of this event on the Civil Society Declaration for the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. First, I would like to thank the International Federation for Family Development for organizing this event and for the leadership it took in mobilizing the civil society for the preparations of the 30th anniversary. Historically, IFFD was very instrumental in mobilizing civil society support for the 20th anniversary when we were focusing on poverty, work family balance and intergenerational relations. IFFD and other civil society organizations, namely the Doha International Family Institute, the European Large Family Association, the European Federation of Parents and Carers at Home, Haro's Platform on Family Policies from Sweden, as well as the Large Family Association of Hungary, took active part in the preparations of the declaration. This group of transnational civil society organizations took on board the mega trends suggested by the United Nations Secretary General and worked on incorporating them into the civil society declaration for the 30th anniversary. Then they enriched the points of the declaration with focus groups that have been convened to elaborate on the megatrends and their impact on families and offered recommendations. A lot of work has been put into drafting the declaration. Thank you all for your engagement and support. Much has changed over the last decade. Major global trends have been accelerating, imp impacting families all around the world. The Department of Economic and Social Affairs has identified several me megatrends worth close scrutiny from an economic and social policy perspective. The trends are technological change, migration, urbanization, demographic changes, and climate change. We have started with technological change, focusing on new technologies and their impact on families, especially in the areas of parenting, education, and work-family balance. This year, we are focusing on migration and urbanization with the launch of a major background paper on the topic. Next year, we will address demographic changes and in 2024, we will be devoting um, our deliberations to climate change as well as interlinkages between the, all the trends. Let me say a few words about the trends we have covered so far. Technology. As you may know, last year, the ISD UNDESA published a paper on technology focusing especially on parenting, education, and work-family balance. We generated a lot of interest in the topic, with many civil society events taking place, focusing on different aspects of technology impacts, especially on children. We offered recommendations, not just for policymakers, but families themselves. For example, in terms of appropriate age, content, and time for use of devices. I know that many of you gathered here, NGOs, care about parenting education, and the paper shows how to use new technologies to scale it up. This year, we are focusing on megatrends of migration and urbanization. In terms of migration, I would like to mention the policy brief we issued for the International Day of Families, which emphasizes that migration is a family decision and that it is family migration that drives overall migration nowadays. We recommend more focus on transnational families and transnational motherhood. We emphasize that it is indispensable to incorporate the family perspective into migration policy analysis. Thus, policies facilitating family reunification, social protection, and intergenerational support are key in successful integration of migrant families. At the observance of the International Day of Families, a comprehensive background paper on migration and urbanization and family dimension, authored by Professor Bahira Sharif Trask, has been launched to raise awareness of these important megatrends. As for urbanization, from a UN perspective, it is worth mentioning that urbanization was recognized as a megatrend in 2018 by the UN Senior Management Group, which called upon UN Habitat to facilitate cooperation among agencies to advance sustainable urbanization. Under the new urban agenda, periodic reviews to track progress are followed. Still, in the 2018-2022 reporting cycle, only 25 countries submitted progress reports. To remedy this situation, supplemental regional reviews, participatory consultation with partners, and review of local reporting is done. Here, civil society efforts, such as Venice Declaration, are encouraged and well appreciated.
It is very uplifting to see the engagement of civil society and your support to our efforts at the United Nations. As you may know, General Assembly resolutions on family issues recommend engaging with civil society on many levels. I believe it's key to cooperate with civil society working in so many areas, helping families on the ground. It is NGOs who know what supports families need. It is NGOs who engage with families. And it is civil society that can spread the message of the importance of family-oriented policies and mobilize public opinion to demand such policies. Civil society's role in advocating for good social policies with policymakers is especially important. Equally important is supporting research in disseminating findings on policy design, implementation, and evaluation. All of you gathered here today focus on some areas of what I mentioned and do your best to improve the well-being of families in your countries and regions. Still, in addition to your efforts on the ground, you are active at the international level and support our work at the United Nations. I am truly grateful for your engagement and I'm looking forward to our continued cooperation. I encourage civil society organizations to join the declaration and continue your support for the work on family issues at the international, regional, and national levels. Thank you. I'll appreciate your efforts and engagement, Renata. Thank you for your presentation. We will now continue with the roundtable discussion. First, we will have an intro uh, from Ignacio Socias, Director of Communication and International Relations uh, from IFFD, International Federation for Family Development. And he will explain to us the process of drafting the declaration. So I give the floor to you, Ignacio. Thank you very much, Caroline. And let me start by thanking all of you, including those who are watching us online, being here present today. We have, as we just saw, the focal point on the family of UNDESA. We have also UNICEF represented by the head of advocacy. We have also many organizations, not only those who are partnering for these preparations up to now, as the Doha Family Institute, the European Federation of Parents and Cars at Home, the European Last Families Confederation, the organization NOE from Hungary, but also many who are today here present as the Federation of Catholic Family Associations in Europe, World Youth Alliance, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Don Bosco International, the region of Kuyasko, Pomorskie, etc., etc. And then, registered to attend online, we have more than 80 other organizations from 48 countries. So we really hope that this is, as the name of the event suggests, a kickoff for a process that will bring all of us really far in this understanding of what the social role of families is. You know, Renata was mentioning it, that the 20th anniversary was a great step forward. Let me tell you it with the words of the Secretary General in his report about that year. Worldwide, civil society has been actively engaged in the preparations for an observance of the 20th anniversary of the International Year. The Civil Society Declaration prepared for that year on the occasion of the 20th anniversary proposed and disseminated by IFFD, was sponsored by 27 international entities and signed by over 542 civil society representatives from 285 national organizations, as well as elected officials, academics, and individuals. The preparations by civil society also included promoting the objectives of the anniversary, mobilizing support for this declaration and organizing a number of awareness raising events throughout the year. 
it also carried out several communications projects to promote a family perspective among governments and international organizations. That is to say, we already had done something in the past, and many of you were present there, that we needed now even to make it better because the situation helps us. You know that we are living in a situation, historical situation, because of the pandemic, because of the economic crisis, now even because of the situation of in, we have in, in Europe. And that shows us very, very clearly that the role of the family, the social role of the family, the importance of family for development is every day clearer. The family, you know it well, performs various valuable functions for its members, and perhaps most important of all, it provides for emotional and psychological security, particularly through the warm love and companionship, companionship that living together generates between spouses and in turn between them and their children. The family also provides a valuable social and political function by institutionalizing procreation and by providing guidelines for the regulation of the behavior. The family additionally provides such other socially beneficial functions as the rearing and socialization of children, along with such humanitarian activities as caring for its members when they are sick or disabled. On the economic side, the family provides food, shelter, clothing, and physical security for its members, some of whom are too young or too old to provide for the necessities of life themselves. Finally, on the social side, the family may serve to promote order and stability within the society as a whole. Last Friday, we had this event for the observance of the International Day of Families, and some representatives from the Polish region of Kujawsko Pomorskie, who is also here today, were explaining how important families have been in the Ukrainian crisis and, and how also Polish families have been able to welcome so many people. And as it's typical of the role of the family, to make hardship easier to face, to make all these things that are really hard a bit easier. So that is why um, we want this process to go really far. You know, probably that we started in 2018, where we had the first meeting of um, all the societies trying to design what we're going to do in London. Uh, all of, of you who are partners of us were there. And how since then we have been working on this civil society declaration step by step. I'm not going to repeat, because Caroline already said it, how many online meetings, how many expert group meetings, how many focus groups, how many uh, bilateral meetings we have uh, held up to now. But of course, we won't stop here. We want you, all of you, as many civil society organizations as possible, to be part of this. You will be shown a QR code, uh, a link in the same page of this event. You will be able to contribute both to the civil society declaration and also to all the events we are preparing for uh, the celebration and for this uh, observance. So, mm, I really hope we all feel engaged. We don't want 
one side or the other side or whatever to be involved. We want all society to be involved to really help families because families are something we all depend on. We have here at least, I think, 14 countries today. Online, we have 48 countries, probably 40 more. What make all of us be here? The same thing worldwide, that we need families, we need strong families for the future. We don't need, I don't know, to, to become like too um, melancholic about the past because the present also has very good things. We don't need to become very idealistic about the future because we know that there are difficulties. But what we need to do is to acknowledge the importance of families and to work together on what is clearly evidence about how much they contribute to society, they contribute to um, human well-being, and they contribute ultimately to the happiness of every one of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignacio, and I also hope that you all want to participate. So now the declaration uh, integrates family needs into the megatrends presented by the United Nations Secretary General. So we will now hear from four organizations that will present each megatrend in the declaration. First up is the megatrend of new technologies. This part of the declaration was enriched by expert recommendation from a focus group held in January 2021. So I give the floor to Khalid Al-Nam from Doha International Family Institute. Thank you very much. Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to be with you here. Thank you, Ignacio, for uh, this remarkable presentation. You have touched uh, something from our heart, and we promise you to work toward this initiative. Caroline, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, my name is Khaled al -Nama. I'm Director of Family Policy, Doha Institute. And um, as you know, Doha Institute is a family and advocacy uh, institute working towards uh, Arab families to promote new policies that uh, can promote the family unity and encourage them uh, to stay together during the the crisis and so on we know a lot of uh, challenge happening recently crisis economic issues pandemics and so on so what we do in, in in qatar we try as much as we could to work with our partners strategic partners to form those strategic relationship with them uh, toward those initiatives of course without you know collaboration we'll not be able to achieve our goals i don't want to take uh, so much from our time from your time but my uh, dear colleague Ahmed uh, is going, inshallah, to talk much about the uh, uh, one of the megatrends that we are going to focus on in our upcoming AGM. Ahmed, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Khalid. Hello everyone, and it's a real uh, pleasure uh, to be here among our uh, friends and partners. Thank you, Ignacio, for the invitation. Thank you, uh, all of you, for the uh, great efforts that we put together into this uh, declaration. Let me uh, go step back uh, to uh, 1994 with the start of the um, announcement of the International Year of the Family. And then the state of Qatar uh, was very much committed to think about the family and to institutionalize the, 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 the family file in general in the Arab region because we do have many academic institutes that do several research in terms of uh, family well-being, cohesion, but there is no single entity in the Arab countries that is working at that time towards the development of knowledge production, evidence, trying to transform this evidence into policy outputs and advocate for a change. 
So the uh, International Year of the Family celebration, the 10th anniversary, which was in 2004, was the commitment, it was held in, in Qatar, and there was a commitment to establish a center that advanced the knowledge on Arab families and worked to advocate family policies in the Arab countries. So after two years of this uh, declaration uh, in uh, 2004, in 2006, DFI, the Doha International Family Institute, was established for this particular reason. I don't want to take too much time to highlight what DFI did uh, in, in terms of you know, development of family policies, not only in Qatar, but in many Arab countries, but to particular uh, emphasis on this uh, occasion of the International uh, Year of the Family Preparation, we did the uh, 20th anniversary of the International Year of the Family in 2014. Ignacio, IFFD, uh, Alex, our, our friends from all over the globe, was part of this momentum. We had a huge global conference on empowering families, a pathway to development, where we developed a call to action. And this particular meeting today and the kickoff start of the declaration reminds me of the great effort we did together in the uh, development of the Doha uh, call to action. And to this particular effect, I would emphasize what just Ignacio mentioned. We don't need to call it just a kickoff start or a meeting, but it's a kickoff commitment, uh, you know, to, to try to together with our partners, with our, uh, you know, governments that we are working in close collaboration with, um, to have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, advocacy uh, efforts in order to emphasize the family and mainstream family in the uh, development agenda, particularly in uh, crisis uh, times as we see in COVID-19. Uh, last but not least, DFI is gonna uh, celebrate the International uh, Year of the Family, the third anniversary, which is gonna take place in 2024 with the great uh, support, collaboration, and partnership by uh, Renata, the UN Focal Point on the Family, UN DESA, with many international uh, NGOs and UN uh, entities. I wish the uh, kickoff uh, of the declaration today is also to be part of this momentum with all the engaged uh, partners here to be also partners of the uh, 2024 uh, anniversary of the uh, 30th uh, anniversary of the International Year of the Family. And we have uh, an EGM in preparation for this uh, 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 International Year of the Family, which will take place in uh, Cairo, um, 2nd and 5th of uh, June, very soon, and will focus on one of the mega trends which is related to new technologies. To discuss and explore of the positive impacts of new technologies on family well-being in terms of enhancing fertility, reproductive uh, health, in terms of um, uh, enhancing the approaches to parenting education, to marital education, um, advancing the, the whole system of uh, education and work, uh, work family balance, but also to discuss and explore the negative consequences of such new technologies in terms of, um, for instance, the cyber bully, bullying, the impact on uh, digital addiction, and how these new technologies could also hinder the uh, intergenerational ties and uh, solidarity. Thank you so much, and uh, wish all of us a, a, a very excellent um, kickoff. Thank you. Thank you both Khalid and Ahmed. So now we will hear from Regina Maroncelli from the European Large Families Confederation. She will uh, elaborate on the second part of the declaration regarding urbanization. The points were also enriched by recommendations of a focus group held in November 2021. So Regina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers 
and uh, all of us for being here and uh, working on this very important document. Um, talking about uh, urbanization, let me give you some numbers. Maybe you know them, but uh, it's always good to remember. Urban population worldwide is 56% of the global. Uh, in Europe, it represents 75% of total population. By 2050, it is projected to be that two thirds of the world population will live in urban area. Um, still, in Europe now, uh, less than three households out of 10 include children. And this, I think, is, has to be taken into account uh, as a reason why we often forget about families with children. Uh, designed more for cars and business, uh, more than people, urban settlement seems to have forgotten their original goals, so the, which are to host, protect and sustain generation. Uh, UNICEF has uh, unveiled a very interesting paradox, the urban paradox. Intra-urban disparities can be so large that many of the most disadvantaged children in urban areas fare worse than children in rural areas. So uh, even though uh, people tend to move to cities, to urban areas to improve their living standards, and uh, often do, uh, children seem to suffer uh, for more uh, poverty and uh, disadvantages. Against these uh, problems, uh, there are uh, several um, institutions that try to, to fight uh, and to try to, to build a, a better environment in cities. And let me tell you about uh, the European Family Network of Municipalities, uh, which we have settled with a partnership of the uh, autonomous province of uh, Trento and the Inclusive Cities for Sustainable Families, which was established by IFFD with the province, uh, with the uh, Veneto region. Uh, these are uh, best practice, good practices that try to, to put the focus on families and uh, try to, to change, um, uh, to work on that paradox I was telling you before. Family is not optional. Uh, and let me uh, read some words that you can find on the declaration. We recognize that the child for the full and harmonious development of his or her personality should grow up in a family environment. As a, consequences, as a consequence, family policy should be a mainstay of national public policies everywhere and the most meaningful vehicle for governments to influence the living standards of all generations. Families are not the object of service, but they are or they should become co-authors and protagonists of them. What does this mean? It means to, and let me quote again the declaration, to recognize the right to, fa for, to family reunification and establish safe remittance for migrants and their families, while addressing context-specific needs and requirements for mothers, fathers, and caregivers. Uh, by the way, talking about best practice, um, we have this uh, family-friendly uh, municipality, which is Alguero, lovely place in Sardinia, uh, that uh, welcomed and uh, hosted uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees uh, hardly. Uh, and very fast, then they live in Sardinia, which is not really close to Ukraine. Uh, but it was uh, um, easy, it was easier for them to organize it because the municipality, the community was organized in order uh, to be a community, a welcoming of community. And it means, and here I quote again the declaration, support positive economic, social and enver environmental links between urban, peri-urban and rural areas by strengthening families' engagement and national and regional development, planning with the creation of family sustainability councils. And here, uh, let me talk about uh, a very nice, a good practice I learned in Trentino, 
where a group of families started their own uh, um, kindergarten where everybody was uh, accepted uh, without paying. Uh, mothers would look after each other's children and uh, the municipalities helped them um, with these uh, initiatives, uh, providing um, places. Uh, I, unfortunately, I can't, I can't show you the picture, but they have a beautiful garden and a very nice place where the children can play. So uh, families can be involved in the planning, realization and evaluation of such policies. A service in, and even uh, urbanistic planning of cities according to their real needs. What they need is to be heard and listened to. So being, um, uh, and I want to quote again the third part of, uh, the, um, of the declaration concerning urban, uh, urbanism. Plan and implement family responsive urban spaces that are inclusive, safe, resilient, healthy, affordable, and sustainable in order for families to thrive. Uh, which means remove obstacle and support the well being of all family members, beginning with the most vulnerable ones, children and elderly. How? Uh, it can be very easy. Uh, another picture that you are not going to see is a, um, a road of um, road signal that says the traffic is the slow down in these uh, towns children still are playing on the road uh, it's a uh, it has become uh, and we say a road in Italy and that's a specific um, housing for young couples, um, trails, uh, um, uh, bike, uh, bike um, family bikes, uh, trails, uh, which are um, something easy to, um, to organize, but they, um, they manage to form a, a, a place where it's nice to live. Uh, in fact, the local administrations are the closest entity for people, and their aim should be to promote the well being of its uh, inhabitants. That is why, and here I promote again, I, I quote again the declaration we promote a better consideration of well being and mental health issues for, of caregivers and care recipients through research, good practice, and intervention. Um, I have the example of this town uh, in um, Tofa, I think, in, um, in Portugal, uh, which has uh, lots of things for his um, elderly. For example, home telecare, self, uh, botch tournaments, uh, holiday camps, um, uh, ateliers, home library, cars, uh, and of course, dedicated um, response center for treatment, prevention, and reintegration. So uh, there are many different levels where well being can be adopted uh, if you put at the center uh, the family well being. Um, in, in all this, what is the role of the family? Uh, in the declaration, we read that, that we reaffirm the role of the family unit as one of the main agents for recovery, governance, protection, and education. Uh, we the COVID has unveiled the, the unreplaceable role of family in society. We can be families, I mean, we can be everything from a school to hospital, from workspace to care center, uh, and where nobody is left behind. Uh, so this is all we need to reaffirm and empower. 
it has been recognized that families are a fundamental key factor to achieve many, if not all, of the sustainable development goals. It's time to recognize it. There are so many culturing, volunteering, high-tech cities, smart city, green city, eco-partnership, sister city. We have the UNICEF child-friendly cities. We have uh, our network, I-50s. Uh, there are so many, but it's only, uh, let me say that it's only putting the family at the earth heart of any of these networks of these initiatives about urban settlements that these projects will have a soul and a body and a meaning a direction and in many cases a future thank you thank you regina um, allow me now to introduce our next theme, which will be demographic shifts. And this is the most extensive part of, of the declaration because all members of the family are contemplated. Uh, it was also enriched by expert recommendation from a focus group held in January 2022. And my colleague from Sweden, Madeleine Wallin from European Federation of Parents and Carers at Home will elaborate on this. So. So thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, my name is Madeleine Valin, and I'm the General Secretary of uh, FIFAF, the European Federation of Parents and Carers at Home, and also the International Coordinator of HARO, the Swedish organization. And I previously served at pres as president in both organizations. FIFAF is a non-denominational and non-partisan uh, organization and its main focus is seeking recognition of the unpaid caregiving work. For the last 22 years, I have worked on a voluntary basis, driven by my own experiences as a mother of five children and the lack of acknowledgement of the most important work there is, caring for and raising children. So I see myself as a motherhood activist. One of the mega trends is demographic shifts. And the question is what families need in order to thrive in these ongoing changes. In the world today, we see a population that is increasing in most continents, even though the pace is slowing down. But in Europe, the tendency is the opposite with the decline in fertility rates with on average 1.6 child per woman while in africa it's the number is 4.2 the working group has agreed on six points and have been working on them for a long time but still i'm quite sure there is some room for improvements i will not read all of the text just a short conclusion and go more deep into two of them one, provide assistance, care and protection for all family members. Two, develop, promote and implement policies aimed at ending child poverty. Three, promote initiatives on early childhood development. Four, develop, invest in and implement programs for family strengthening and parenting education. Five, support the role of the family during youth transition. Six, recognize, protect, and value unpaid care and domestic work. So some words and additional thoughts on promoting initiatives on early childhood development. The first years of life impacts on the whole of adulthood and must be prior prioritized and protected if we want to shape the world into a peaceful and sustainable society. Today, we have so much knowledge about the brain development and the sensitive first years of life. And research shows how crucial attachment with primary caregivers are during the first three years. The way forward should be based on long-term strategies, research and experience, independent of government changes and different ideologies 
where children and their families are prioritized in all decision making. A good example comes from Finland, where they have created a national strategy for children with long term visions for, for a child and family friendly society. The vision has the following seven aims. Every child and young person has safe adults in their lives who are close to them and act with their best interest at heart. Every child, young person and parent or guardian is a member of a community and feels that they belong to it and can make a difference. Families spend more time together and feel the positive effects. Children and young people have stronger friendships and feel less lonely. Every child and young person has a pathway to growth and learning that acknowledges individual differences. People can have as many or as few children as they wish. And the last one, child poverty will be reduced. So to make this vision come true, the key leadership tools include decision making, based on the child's rights and the culture led by families and children. So the, uh, the other, the, um, number six is to recognize, protect and value unpaid care and domestic work. My favorite subject. In the UN report, Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, the Special Rapporteur, Dr. Magdalena Sepulveda, said that domestic work in caring for people has remained largely invisible in economic calculations, statistics, policy and political discourse and is commonly undervalued by society and policymakers, despite the fact that its monetary value is estimated at from 10 to over 50 percent of GDP. Economic security must be strengthened throughout the life cycle and unpaid caregivers seen as rights holders and given a voice in decision making. Poverty should not be the reward after a life spent caring for others. So in order to make the care count and to make so called inactive persons a part of the system, we redistribute the unpaid work and force separations between children and mothers. So if another woman cares for my child, it is suddenly valued. But if I do it myself, it's invisible. The question is, do we get the same outcome? Unpaid work has increased during the pandemic and women take the main care responsibility. COVID-19 has given us new opportunities to realize what is necessary and how to create new ways forward. Care remains at the heart of society. And if we want to create a world resilient to future crises, we must put human beings and care at the center of all responses, starting with the most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. So we are now moving on to our last megatrend and presentation on climate change. And we will hear from Kinga Jo from Noe. So the floor is yours, Kinga. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon to uh, all of you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say that it is an honor uh, to take part in this uh, preparation uh, at the initiative uh, of uh, IFFD. Uh, and I would also like to uh, say that uh, in Hungary, uh, we are looking forward uh, to a very busy 2024 in terms uh, of uh, international events, because of course this is uh, the 30th anniversary of the International Year of Family, but this will be also the year uh, when uh, Hungary will hold the presidency of the European uh, Union. And Noah will uh, absolutely advocate uh, for links between the 30th anniversary uh, and this EU Council presidency. So please uh, keep this in mind. Uh, Noah is one of the largest uh, family associations uh, in Europe uh, with its 16,000 uh, member families and uh, 200 local associations in and around Hungary. 
Uh, we represent the large families, that is uh, families who raise, have raised, or uh, intend to have three or more uh, children. We are turning uh, 35 years old this autumn, and ever since the establishment of the association, it had a declared commitment uh, to serve future generations. In this spirit already since uh, the 1980s, NOAA engages in environmental protection programs to, uh, to preserve the inheritance that is our planet for our children and all upcoming generations. Last year, in July, we hosted the 10th uh, European Large Families Conference. The motto of the conference was, the birthplace of sustainability is family. I'd like to invite everyone to think about this statement uh, for a moment, about the relationship between families and sustainability. We hear nowadays uh, too often how generations are turned against each other in some very unfortunate statements like grandparents are putting pressure on grandchildren. But in fact, this is not only completely illogical and false, and we experience, but, but we experience exactly the opposite. We see that families want to build a better future for their children. And to underline this strong correlation between families and sustainability, also with data, I'd like to refer to the survey conducted last year by the Maria Kopp Institute, together with our association and our European partner, ALFAG. Both European and Hungarian families are interested and engaged in environmental protection, and it is important to them, primarily because of the future of their children. So for the question, why do you think environmental protection is important? The answer of more than 80% of those who have taken the survey was that because of the future of our children. Moreover, large families strongly agree that those having children have a more responsible attitude towards the environment. The civil society declaration states about climate change that we need to develop strategies to face the impact of climate change on families and we need to better understand the active role of families in green practices. NOAA fully supports these statements and it wishes to provide good examples and to join forces with all civil society actors of the same view. Climate change is a global challenge and it addresses globally and it is addressed globally in the United Nations Sustainable Goals. The European Green Deal launched by the European Commission reflects the EU's commitment to these uh, SDGs. But all these commitments will be in vain if we do not act on local and small community level, on the level of our families. We need to look at the resilience of families and households in relation to climate change, especially the social and economic implications. An integrated approach across different public policy areas, such as energy, housing, employment, should be adopted when designing and implementing necessary measures. We also need to mitigate as much as possible the impacts of climate change and transit towards climate neutrality. In this line, a proactive engagement is needed. From last year's survey, we saw the rate of engagement of large families across Europe for example, in waste collection, almost all families are taking an active role in recycling. More than 90% of the families said that they are sorting out plastic, paper, and more than 60% reuse clothes and shoes. Last but not least, where possible, we should see families as prosumers, not only consumers of energy and other resources, natural resources, but also as producers. Besides thinking here about example solar panels that can provide for electricity in a private household, we should also see families being prosumers in the social sense, as they provide the future generations, as this is where children are born who sustain our cultural, scientific, that is human inheritance. Thank you. Thank you, Kinga. And I would like to thank all of our presenters today because we have now reached the end of the roundtable section. 
Now, we are all family-focused organizations, and we know how important parents are for the upbringing of the future generation. The power of positive parenting and attachment in early childhood is crucial. And UNICEF has recently started the initiative of Parent Month, and we are happy to have UNICEF on board, um, as we now will hear from Benjamin Perks as our closing remarks. Um, Benjamin Perks is the head of campaigns and advocacy in the Division of Global Communications and Advocacy at the United Nations Children's Fund based in New York. He leads on public and policy advocacy on issues related to the survival, development and protection of children. He is a member of the policy advisory group on the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. He has served in human rights diplomacy roles at the, as the UNICEF representative in Republic of North Macedonia, Republic of Montenegro, Georgia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, India, and Albania. He is recognized as a public speaker, blogger, and influencer on violence against children and adverse childhood experience. So, Benjamin. Thank you uh, so Thank much. You, uh, so for the warm introduction. Um, I'm really honored and happy to be with you at this important uh, event today. Um, I think that we would all agree that recent, um, recent events, COVID-19 in particular, the conflict in, in, in Ukraine and, and conflicts and other crises around the world continue to highlight how the family and parents are the single most important protective factor in the in the life of uh, of any uh, any child and i think the science and research in neurobiology in psychology in pedagogy and pediatrics coming together in recent years to really give us a, a, an understanding of the things that children need within a family to uh, to grow and we know that and to grow healthily we know that when children are born, they're not born and then start relationships, they are born into relationships, they recognize the voice of a mother at birth, they are already connected within communities and on at birth, they seek to nestle within the strong attachment, some of the colleagues talked about attachment, to nestle within the, the protective attachment of, of a parent and a family. And this is really essential for three, three reasons. Firstly, it is really essential for the protection of children. As a species, we are dependent for much longer than any other species on, uh, on parents and families to protect us as we grow up. Secondly, children need parents uh, and need that attachment as part of a partnership to learn to navigate the world. And thirdly, they need that attachment because all human beings have a biological imperative to be loved, love, to love and to be loved, to, uh, to be connected and to have a sense of belonging. But we have, and we've become more aware of in recent years, the biggest obstacle to that attachment, which is abuse, neglect, and dysfunctional parenting. And over the past couple of decades, we have begin to, begun to get a sense of the magnitude uh, and the universality of this challenge. Data from Saudi Arabia to the United States, from South Africa to, uh, to, to the Far East and Vietnam, all show similar levels of risk for abuse, neglect, and dysfunctional parenting having an impact on children, often occurring across generations without ever being talked about, often um, resulting in parents, often unintentionally doing harm uh, to their children. We know, that, uh, we know that adverse childhood experiences are the single biggest preventative cause of mental illness throughout the life cycle and contribute to a whole range of social problems, addiction, uh, obesity, um, poverty, poor learning outcomes, and the possibility and risk of being a victim or perpetrator of violence throughout the life cycle. Um, but as we have learned this, we have also learned that we can uh, dramatically reduce uh, adverse childhood experiences 
by treating the problem as a public health problem, by treating it the way we would treat COVID-19. And that requires three things. The first one is to make everybody aware of the risk. The second one is to prevent transmission before it occurs. Uh, and the third one is to help those who've been affected to recover so they don't go on to transmit trauma to future generations. So to just go through those three things very quickly, because this forms the heart of UNICEF's global advocacy uh, work. Um, at the, at the current period. Uh, the first one, by making everybody aware of the risk, we need to have every community in the world, every parliament, every, uh, every society have very public conversations about adversity, about abuse, neglect, and dysfunctional parenting. Conversations that do three things. Remove the stigma and judgment uh, around the issue. Make parents and families and communities literate and aware of these particular challenges, things like attachment, toxic stress, um, and the importance of connection and belonging in the lives of children. And thirdly, get communities to focus on solutions. The second thing that we need to do is to prevent transmission before it occurs. And that involves ensuring that parenting programs that provide a minimum package of evidence-based support for parents to uh, have knowledge, self-awareness and resources to, uh, to adequately nurture and attach with children, they need to be available universally. We believe uh, that it's possible that governments around the world can make a minimum package, maybe five to seven home visits in the first part of life um, and then have critical uh, follow-up visits at critical moments during childhood. We believe that could be made available to uh, every parent in the same way that we try to make vaccines available to every child. And the third thing is to, is to create schools and communities where everybody uh, feels a sense of protection and belong, uh, a sense of belonging, connection, and feels safe, seen, and soothed. There is no such thing as a trauma neutral school or workplace. Any uh, environment either exacerbates or soothes trauma. We need to make sure that we build communities and schools and societies that soothe and help people recover from uh, trauma. These are three really ambitious, audacious um, um, policy asks for governments around the world. And often when we talk about our desire to eradicate child maltreatment for every child on the planet, we get told that this is way too ambitious and, uh, and impossible to achieve. But I just want to share one important piece of history with you. In 1980, only 20% of the world's children were vaccinated against the five major childhood diseases. Because of a concerted effort by UNICEF, um, World Health Organization, governments around the world and civil society organizations like yours, like the coalition to, uh, here today, um, the vaccine coverage against those diseases was, was increased to 80% within a decade. Concerted, focused effort increased vaccine coverage against the five major childhood diseases from 20% to 80% of the world's children in just a decade. And as a result, child mortality reduced by 61% in the decade that followed. If we can come together and make a commitment and uh, put all of our energy in a focused effort to end the intergenerational transmission of abuse, neglect, and dysfunctional um, parenting, we can do an enormous amount to help families thrive and flourish throughout the world and give the best possible start in life to children everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin. We have now come to the end of the event where we would like to hear your voices. We have some organizations that have submitted statements of their willingness to be part of this work. And we will start with um, uh, to hear from uh, the, the organizations in person in the room. 
let me just remind you of your time frame of keeping the segment of maximum of two minutes. So first I give the floor to World Youth Alliance, Ina Delic. Uh, first of all, thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of World Youth Alliance. In our Declaration of Family, drafted on this occasion 20 years ago, we affirmed that the family is a school of deeper humanity within each uh, member learns the best what it means to be a human person. There, each human person, from conception until natural death, experiences the gift of unconditional love. Thus, each human is carefully taught by family to, responsible, to be responsible, to commit, to share, and to love. Within the family, children first come to understand their own intrinsic human dignity through their complementary roles. Mother and father, equal in dignity, show their children the freedom of the human person in most fully and rightfully lived in the gift of self. True love, freely and received and given within the family, is an image of transcendental love that makes possible the fulfillment of completion of every human being. The family sustains society and gives life to the next generation. It also has the privilege of forming free and responsible, responsible citizens, thus securing democracy. I'm sorry. As a fundamental unit of society, the family ensures the stability of civilization and culture. It takes the essential task of the care of all and especially the weak and vulnerable ones. Uh, World Youth Alliance members and programs are committed to seeing families thrive and leveraging the, these, we are committed to support the uh, preparations of the 30th anniversary of IF. Thank you. We will now um, hear from Nicola Speranza, Federation of Catholic Family Association in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to speak, to intervene at this kickoff commitment, as you said, uh, for our federation is, 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 is fundamental to be engaged in a dialogue with the international, national and local institutions. And this venue, uh, it's, it's quite significant, as Kinga was saying, uh, it's maybe the most important level, the local level, uh, and to engage in a dialogue together with the family and other family oriented organizations to reflect together on how to bring families back to the global agenda, reflecting on the progress we made and inspiring meaningful commitments towards sustainable solutions for families. In uh, our last autumn resolutions, uh, resolution, our federation uh, invited institutions and national governments to consider the EU demographic crisis with the same attention given to the digital and green transitions. So not only a twin transition then, but a threefold transition, digital, green, and demographic. Our Federation also invited decision makers to recognize the family as a main driver of recovery in all its aspects. Public policies will only be sustainable if families are recognized and valued as a resource of primary importance, resulting in a special attention given to the freedom of family to pursue in the best possible conditions and without obstacles, their joyful responsibility to care for the integral development of their children and overall of their community in a positive dialogue between generations. As done at this event today, to reach these ambitious objectives, it is fundamental to listen to the voice of family associations and to value the fundamental fact function of family networks and communities, this sense of belonging we were listening now, meet, to meet the sustainable development goals in line with the principle of subsidiarity. Thank you very much for your attention and many thanks to the organizers. Thank you. 
We will now hear from Ilena Kurtopasi, Veneto Region, Elisan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, this uh, statement uh, will be delivered on behalf of Roberto Ciambetti, who is president of the Veneto Regional Council and also vice president of ELISEN, which is the European Local Inclusion and Social Action Network. Well, first of all, thank you very much to the autonomous province of Trento, and thank you very much to the autonomous province of Bolzano, South Tyrol, for their co-hosting. Thank you very much. So, uh, as a vice president of ELISEN, uh, who has a participatory status at the Council of Europe, and who was, uh, which was set up at the Committee of the Regions, we are very proud to contribute with IFFD and all the organizations involved, including the Veneto region, and of course the UN focal point of uh, um, Renata, to the preparation of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family with the launch of the Civil Society Declaration. First of all, at regional level, historically, family policies play a central and decisive role in social, economic, and cultural growth by strengthening social cohesion and relationships. Especially today, childhood protection involves both regions suffering from decreased birth rate and those experiences a demographic boom. So early childhood services should no longer play only the role of care providers, but as said before, also be oriented toward parenting, education, and family. As evidence of this, the Veneto region with regional law number 20 of 20 May, 28th of May, 2020, uh, in, uh, interventions to support family and birth promotes organic and integrated policies aiming at recognizing and supporting the family in its social functions. The objectives of this law favor the implementation of the European Child Guarantee through, for example, removing social, cultural, economic barriers, preventing situations of poverty and social exclusion. Um, Ellison and the Veneto region are alleging also about the imminent threats coming from hunger and poverty. Hundreds of millions of human beings and families, above all in Africa, are risking to suffer from famine. This is utterly unacceptable. The current challenges linked to the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the demographic scenarios, and the fight against climate change with the UN megatrends call for more investment in the potential of families as key players for social, cultural, and economic recovery. In this framework, you can understand the importance of social stakeholders as IFFD, and that because of their work together with all of you and whoever supports family is invaluable. For these reasons, and with the conviction that only together we can overcome today's challenge, I reaffirm that the Ellison Network and the Veneto region will be most interested in sharing good practices to identify responses and disseminate the aims of the civil society declaration, a society respecting people's rights. So thank you very much. And thank you also, Caroline, for your moderation. Thank you, Elena. 
Now we will have an online statement from Maria Kopp Institute for Dem Demography and Families. So, Balas Molnar. Indeed, thank you very much, Caroline. It is a pleasure to, to be here among uh, colleagues and friends. Um, I would like to say that the Maria Kopp Institute for Demography and Families welcomes the initiative of drafting a civil society declaration for the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. We would wholeheartedly like to thank IFFD and all stakeholders for their preparatory work. Indeed, we can fully subscribe to the notion that family as the fundamental building block of society has a vital role in recovery, governance, protection, education, care and development. And let us add just as much and just as importantly to the well-being within our societies. We would like to emphasize the role of family policies helping citizens in having the desired number of children and by that tackling the demographic challenges characteristic for most of our countries. We fully agree that children should grow up in a safe and loving family environment for the harmonious development of their personality. And in this context, we would also like to emphasize the rights of parents when deciding about the education of their children. We are convinced that family are the key for a green and sustainable future. You could hear Kinga's presentation about the research done by our institute in cooperation with NOAA and ELFAC. Um, helping families to energy efficient home ownership or the planting of 10 trees at every childbirth are among other programs of Hungary in this respect. We are convinced that the rural way of life should be provided additional attention. Hungary, for example, started a dedicated development program for rural settlements experiencing depopulation. We welcome that the declaration strengthens marriage, as we all know that more children are born to married couples than to cohabiting ones. We suggest that family taxation targets all families, not only disadvantaged families. We would like to recall the importance of family transfers in effectively reducing child poverty and the intergenerational transmission of poverty. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Balas. We will now have some statements that are pre-recorded and they will introduce themselves. So if you could run them. Investment in families is often seen as the most effective strategy for social protection. That's why we firmly believe that investing in family policies must be a priority for governments at national and local levels. We, from Family Talks, a civil society organization from Brazil, are very glad to be part of this coalition of organizations to celebrate the 30 years of the Year of the Family. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Juan Antonio Lopez Valjar. I'm director of the Family Policy Analysis Institute from Mexico. We design and promote family policies for sustainable development. We recognize the importance of the International Year of the Family in 2024. This year is a great moment to support the efforts for family around the world and promote the commitment of the government's civil society organizations and other stakeholders. Mexico as a country has many public problems like public security, family economy, social inequality, education, among, among other issues. At the Family Policy Analysis Institute, we are committed to promote and consolidate processes for family research, family policy design, building skills for local governments and social participation models for families to build family sustainable cities and the implementation of the Venice Declaration. We believe that the family is a fundamental factor to attend the social and economic issues in Mexico and around the world. We are looking forward 2024 with much enthusiasm and are working with all of you to promote sustainable families. Thank you very much. Greetings, everyone. I am Rémi Verlick, speaking from Paris for Famille Durable. As we are looking forward to the global observance of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family, I went to my history books and noticed an interesting paragraph. 
in the presidential speech marking the end of the initial international year of the family in 1994. French President François Mitterrand evoked both the missions of families and the duties of states. And I think it's very important to underline both dynamics. President Mitterrand then declared, it's useful at this moment of our history that the principles that have ensured the permanence of family throughout centuries and in all societies be reaffirmed. The natural link between generations from which new links are created the place where children are welcomed during all these years that are so important so that little humans become autonomous. The quest for affection and happiness that humans expect from the privileged relations that flourish in this family environment. The role of families is bigger than ever, resulting from the increase of life expectancy, which precisely often finds itself reduced because of general selfishness. Going forward towards 2024, let's continue to reaffirm the importance of these principles. Families' priorities in France now seem to be work-life balance in a more and more isolated environment, often leading to burnout, whether parental or work-related. But I'd, I'd also mention the need for a better systemic management and care of pregnancies and miscarriages of women at work or out of work during the three first months of pregnancy. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, good luck for the work ahead. Thank you. From Spain, the Family Watch adds to the preparations for the celebration of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family in 2024, as we already did in 2014 with the celebration of the 20th anniversary. Certainly, it's a great opportunity to get family-oriented policies facilitating the achievement of sustainable development goals. And being also very important to focus on these selected megatrends, technological change, migration, urbanization, demographic and climate change, that aims to facilitate the analysis of their impacts on well-being and family life. Altogether, we will give a well-deserved recognition to the role that families have in the development, the progress and the sustainability of a society. Thank you. Uh, we also have a written statement from COFASE and you can find it on the website. So it's been wonderful to hear from uh, some of you and your commitment to the work. We have reached the end of our event. If you are eager to be part of this work and are wondering how you can contribute, let me tell you how. We have a form prepared where you can fill in your suggestions to enrich the declaration. And you can find the form on our website for this event. And we would be happy to have your inputs uh, within the time frame of the following three months with the deadline of September 1st, after which the drafting committee will review it and the final declaration will be finished in November. So we hope that you will commit to submit your ideas so we can collect many voices from families globally. So on behalf of all of us involved in this work, we would like to thank you for your time, your support and engagement in this kickoff event. And thank you and goodbye. <laughs>